This is the Trey Blocker Show. And now uh, the tough part. Got to get in a plane, go through Santiago. We're going to Miami to yeah. run another one. It was great to be back home in the States. Sure. My wife came out and the Wade family just lost their son three weeks prior. Flew from uh, St. Louis to Miami. And I met them at about mile 20 mm. for the first time in person. As you may imagine, very uh, emotional moment. Oh, absolutely. One that I'll never, oh, see, I get, um, you can still feel it. And uh, it was great to see. Jackie ran with me the last few miles, you know, uh, Johnny's brother. Right. And as we finished the race, they gave him a medal uh, for marathon number three. We get these uh, nice medals you know. each time. And I apologize, I should have brought the medals uh, with me. And now you have to fly. And again, this is what was so funny. The people that had done it the year before had given us advice. And they said, now the tough part, marathons four and five. Because marathons four and five, four is in Madrid and five is in Marrakesh, Morocco for Africa. You get knocking out Europe and Africa. Okay. But they're within five hours of one another. Ah, so they're back to back basically. Yeah, yeah. Like literally you're running a marathon. You're pretty much stopping, resting for a few hours and then doing another marathon. Which you are not supposed to do. No, right. no. We're breaking all the rules. And we had done so in that space of 30 hours we're going to be doing three marathons and in the space of 20 hours you're going to be doing or 15 hours you're going to do two wow not not easy Mm-mm. i did uh, miami in about five and a half hours i did spain in about the same time five and a half hours and then morocco was so incredibly hard they didn't like us they don't like westerners per se I, and it was it was midnight we we're exhausted right so we were all cranky what was the temperature I wasn't bad. It was at night, so it was like maybe 40 or 50 degrees. Okay. So fine for running. Okay. We get there, we go to the hotel and simply change into our clothes. And then we go right out and run. And we're doing these little loops of about 2.3 miles. And we're doing it 12 times. It was very difficult. And I'm running with a guy named Stefan Amon, who's uh, German. He lives in Switzerland now. And he, we called him Steady Eddie because he ran all the time. He never walked. But he didn't run fast. Huh. And I would try to run fast and then walk. Gotcha. So we kept passing each other like this. <laughs> and he finally says, Pat, you're driving me crazy. I pass you. You pass me. You're giving me a headache. <laughs> well, I said, Stefan, you know, I like to run and then walk. And you're just... He says, I tell you what. Why don't we run together? Huh. We'll walk for a kilometer. And then we'll run for a kilometer. And I said, all right, let's do that. And we got each other through it really because again you can't do these kinds of things on your own sure and we finished and all 15 runners had our worst personal times in morocco that would make sense yeah not not surprisingly save one mikey masumaki (laughs) mikey we're running i had beaten mikey in all four of the marathons him and like one other person the only ones i I beat consistently and we're, me and Stefan are jogging and we're talking and Mikey passes us. And, I, and that's like, he's ahead of us by two miles and change. I go, did Mikey just lap us? And he goes, yeah, I think, you know, how? We found out the next day how. Because I asked Mikey, I said, Mikey, I looked at the times, man. And even the Marines, everybody had their worst personal time. How did you have your best? And he says, oh, Pat, it's so wonderful. I have found my cancer. He gave me oxycodone. <laughs> I take it. It doesn't feel like I'm running. I feel like I'm floating. And we're just all in tears laughing because there was another story after that race. The Marines said they were passing Mikey. Right. And right before they passed him, he literally ran right into a road sign <laughs> and hit his head. And they said, Pat, he felt like it was a cartoon. Like, dang, 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 and boom. And then he got up and he started running out into traffic. Oh, geez. And through cars. And he was going to get hit by a car. And the Marines ran out and grabbed him and put him back. And it was like the Energizer Bunny. He ran perfectly again. <laughs> and then he says, uh, you know, he check, checks the uh, frequently asked questions. He goes, Pat, I check FAQs. He don't ban it. <laughs> yeah, because nobody thought you'd be crazy enough to. At least not until then. Right? Yeah, I think it's banned now. You can't take oxycodone and run a marathon. And then he had this big gash on his forehead. And he peels his hair back. He goes, look, but look, Pat, I pay for it. <laughs> so, but Mikey had a good day. Uh-huh. Uh, we did not. We ran that marathon in five hours and 50 minutes. Uh, that was Morocco. Morocco. We just have two continents left, gotcha. Asia and Australia. Okay. So we did Dubai. And Dubai was nice. They had it marked track. Uh, it was out on the beach. So we knocked that one out. 
And now we're flying to Sydney, and this is what I really want to focus on, because right. what happened in Sydney, I just believe is a miracle. Sure. Uh, you can all draw your own conclusions, but we land there, and my wife texted me, and now I have full coverage in Sydney, we're in Sydney, mm -hmm. and I'm reading a text from her, and it's about Kimberly Wade, Johnny's mother. And you know, after Miami, they went back to St. Louis. Now they're going back to a home that was a home for four. Right. And now a home for three. And it's three weeks. You can still have, you know, still have that smell in his room of Johnny, mm. you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, she went to visit his grave. And on the grave is a minion's blanket. There should never be a minion's blanket on a grave. Right. You know. So she's so distraught, she can't even drive home. She doesn't even attempt to. Her sister has to come and get her. Oh, wow. So at that very moment, I said, you know, I need to do something for her. And we had joked in Miami, and I said, Kim, she came, you know, Kimberly came up to me and she said, Pat, I know you're going to be fine. I, I know it right. because I know my son's with you. And I said, well, Kimberly, you know, we, 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 know, we would know Johnny's with me if I could break a four-hour marathon, oh, wow. which goes back to this whole genesis of the thing with the four hours. Right. And you know, we both kind of smiled and laughed and said, that's not going to happen. So I get to Sydney, and I've always loved the little drummer boy as a child. Mm-hmm. The whole story and the claymation thing that you know, right. we watch as kids. Right. But I never knew why until that very moment. Because the little drummer boy couldn't give what he wanted to, so he gave what he had. I couldn't give Kimberly what I wanted to give her, but I could give her what I had, right. which was to run that last marathon for Johnny and to prove to her, me, and the world that he was with me. Right. And that is by breaking a four, the four hour mark on the last marathon. Mm -hmm. So I have my plan, as nutty, as crazy as that was. And so James, okay. Because Pat, I would say that you having gotten this far proved that Johnny was with you. So the fact that you were gonna take it up another notch. <laughs> oh, he, yeah, he was, he was, he was definitely with me. But to prove uh, to the world, right, that, right. that he, he was with me, I had my plan in play. And James Alderson was another runner. This fella had completed over 100 ultra marathons hmm. 32 miles 64 miles that's the third the, the 50 k's and the 100 k's okay so james gets a big tall fella thin and he says oi pat what's your plan tonight are you gonna thrive or are you just gonna survive <laughs> and i look at james and i say well james i want to thrive and i tell him my plan that i'm gonna do four hours now james is such a talented runner that the Marines, the 27-year-old Marines are in the Marine Corps Marathon team, right. they came in number one, number two, and all of the marathons. Okay. Save one. Number six in Dubai. Right. James Alderson beat them both. Oh, wow. Because your body starts to change. You're breaking down. You're leaking fluids, ligaments, and if you continue on, you are going to have serious health issues, and um, you're going to be in dire straits. Sure. So James kind of looked at me, and I said, James, I want to break a four-hour marathon tonight. And he just looked at me quizzically and he goes, Oi, Pat, I'm going to try and do four hours tonight because all bodies are shredded, mate. We've got plantar fasciitis. We're leaking fluids and poisons into our bloodstreams. If we do this a few more days, we're all going to die. <laughs> wow. Which, is, okay. you're going you're gonna to yes, heart absolutely. failure, organ failure, whatever. Totally true. And he said, I think James said, and thank God Greenland's not a continent. <laughs> you know, I said, James, I got it and I understand, but I'm going to break four hours tonight. So I'm not moved. And he goes, he just, he says, all right, Pat, then you'll run with me. Mm. And I was running the whole week with big giant head, old school headphones. Right. And Which made you very aerodynamic. That, right. right. Well, that's yeah. what he said. You know, and I always had a <laughs> bottle of water with me at all times, except in Antarctica, because it would have just frozen. Sure. Not much point. And I had my big cell phone. And for music, you know, and it drove all of them nuts because they have like these little things that they run with to put their music in uh -huh. and these little buds uh -huh. and they go perfect form because <laughs> over 26.2, it kind of gets, <laughs> this gets heavy, right? And he says, so I'll tell you what, Pat, you're going to leave those big boogie night headphones <laughs> and your big joint brick and water at the, uh, at the aid station right. and you're going to run with me because I'll pay you. Because we're going to make you more aerodynamic. <laughs> I said, all right, done. So we have a plan. We go to the hotel. We're there for literally a half hour. And we go right to Manly Beach in Sydney, Australia. Sure. 
Uh, on, now we're not running on the sand, they got a boardwalk. Right. We're running a mile and change, back and forth, 13 round trips. Oh, that's gotta get monotonous. So awful. We start, and there's a picture of me looking down the line, because I gotta find where James is, because I'm running with him. I don't have anything, I don't know when we're starting, I just, we're going. Right. I gotta break four hours, right. and he's gonna pace me. And I'm with him. And the wind was really heavy, and it was very humid at the start of the race. And other than Antarctica, we'd had really good running weather. We'd been fortunate. Yeah. So I start running with James, and the wind's at our back. So it's wonderful, that first mile. And he did warn me. He's like, on the next mile, it's going to be a little tougher because it's going to move right in our face. And no kidding, we hit the cone, and we're going back. And the wind changes at that exact moment. So it's at your back again. It's at our back again. And oh, James, wow. I hear James say as we turn, take the turn, Oi, Pat, you were in luck. The wind just changed. Never seen that on Manly Beach. And I just looked up and I said, thank you, Johnny. Oh, wow. And we continue on. Then the wind died out. It wasn't a factor for the rest of the race. The humidity lifted. And it went from pretty much the worst conditions possible to running a back and forth marathon right. to the best. Again, I guess it's another coincidence. Whatever. Sure, sure. I'm with James. We're running. And we're going at a really fast clip and we're in towards the front and what was freaking all the other runners out is we all have food chain here i'm guy 13 okay <laughs> you're guy five right the, maybe six beats four but 13 doesn't beat four mm -mm. and 13 was crushing four mm. but it's a long race and they're going like this like was, was that pat and mikey oh is that pot you know like, <laughs> what are you doing and I, I look at James and I say, James, what kind of pace are we going? Now, he lives in Sydney, so he's home. Right. He's eight miles right. away from this place. I'm 12,000 miles away. Sure. He's got buddies. We had a big crowd. The only time we had a crowd, a real big one, because three of the runners were from Sydney. One okay. was also running for cancer, Heather Hawkins, the one who run the North Pole, won the North Pole Marathon. Right. And it's Manly Beach. It's just a, and it's it's Sydney. a beautiful place. It's beautiful. Yeah. And, they, and they, it was in the local paper, so people just curiosity-wise right. wanted to come out. Right. So we're doing all that. And... Uh, I go, what kind of pace are we running? He says, oh, Pat, we are running at a 3.40 pace. Three hours, 40 minutes. Yeah. We'd agreed on four hours, and that's a stretch for me. Right. Three, a big stretch. 3.40, eh. I go, but why? <laughs> that's a good question. And I'm only speaking to him when I'm exhaling to save energy. I go, but why? And he said, I don't worry, mate. We're putting some time in the bank. Ah. Uh. And he can run 50, 60 miles at a whack. So yeah. he's fine. He's having the time of his life with his, with his buddies. You know, but it, we're running. Another lap or two, it seems like we're honestly, Trey, going even faster. Goes, James, what kind of pace are we going here, man? Mm -hmm. He says, oh, Pat, we're going a 3.30 pace. 3.30. I'm oh, like, geez. God almighty, I don't want to qualify for the Boston Marathon. <laughs> I mean, what are you doing? He says, don't worry, Mike. Told him in the bank. So I said to him, well, I want to make... A withdrawal. <laughs> what we so I, I couldn't keep up. Right. And he goes off with his friends, and I'm by myself. And I cursed him up a storm in my mind. I sure, didn't say anything outwardly, sure. but I was so mad. We had spent two weeks together. I thought we were brothers. How dare you abandon me in my time of need? And now I really question whether or not I'm going to continue. Mm. And certainly the four, I don't know. I'll probably finish the marathon at this point. We're seven, eight miles deep in it. But right. I, I know, I'm not going to make this four-hour thing. That was that was a pipe dream. I mean, there's certain things you just can't do. And the know? pain had to have been overwhelming, right? It was every. It was, uh, you know, like some of the Marines. One of the Marines goes, "Oh, my knee hurts," and they're like, "Oh, my my shoulder." And he said, "Pat, where do you hurt?" And I said, "I'm miserable equally everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it just hurts everywhere." Right. But then something happened, and I said, "You know, Fallon, this isn't about you." This is about Johnny Wade. This is about the thousands of people back at home praying for you. This is about the 400 people that donated to this cause. Right. This is about your family. This is about Johnny's family. This is about your children. And you do it for them. So why don't you buck up and just put your left foot forward and then follow by your right. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you get really focused. So at the, for pretty much the rest of the race, when I, my left foot landed, I said either, in my mind, I said either Johnny and then Wade. And to think of that little boy with his body searing with pain mm -hmm. and fighting for his life and thinking of others and passing away as an eight-year-old weighing 19 pounds and the pain he endured for a year. 
I can suck it up for a few hours. Sure. And uh, so I did, and I kept going. But now I don't know my time. So I know I'm at the halfway mark. And I said, I'll just find out the halfway mark, right. where we're sitting. <clears throat> well, unbeknownst to me, another sidebar story is going on. Richard Donovan, the organizer of the race right. and the owner of the World Marathon Challenge and other races, had told, I had talked to him before and told him about the four-hour plan. And he was all for the effort to raise money for cancer. He's a very nice guy, great, great fella. And he says, you know, Pat, you just have to focus the whole time on why you're doing this. And Richard's the first person that ran a marathon successfully at the South Pole. Oh, wow. And they don't do that anymore because three of the runners almost died. So no one runs marathons at the South Pole anymore. Sure, right. Bad idea. We were in Antarctica close to the South Pole, but not on it. And so anyway, he had told the 15 people, because these are all certified marathons and they verify everything. There were 15 people policing the race. And he said to them, all right, you know, do all your shocks in. he said, runner number seven. His name is Pat Fallon. He's running for a little boy that passed away of cancer. And he's trying to break four hours. He's never run a marathon before until this week. And I really hope he does it. So when he asked for his times, the pipe problem is I'm worried because if he's doing well, he might slack off and then he won't make it. Mm-hmm. But if he's doing poorly, he'll get discouraged and he won't make it. He said, so to hell with it. Don't tell him his times. Oh, wow. And I'm not timing myself because James was, remember, he was going to pace me. That's right. And he's long gone. That's right. And we'd only see each other passing. I go to the halfway point. I ask the fellow there uh, as I land and go back, hey, what's my time? What's my split? Oh, sorry, Mike. No, I'm not, I'm not sure I can tell him. I'm like, why not? He's like, I didn't have time for that. I said, fine. Right. I go run. I go, well, I'll just ask the time at the main station mm-hmm. and minus nine minutes roughly off of it, and we'll see, because I yeah. just needed to do a nine-minute, nine-second pace per mile. I'd make the four-hour break. So I get there, and there's a big clock there that I hadn't really been paying attention to purposely. Sure. And now I go, Oh, well, how's the clock? You know, so I get there, I go, what's my split? What's the time right now? And they're like, oh, oh, it's a clock broke, Mike. <laughs> what do you mean it broke? I know, but I know Richard's keeping it on his wrist. I go, where's Richard? Oh, he's in the loo, Mike. <laughs> what was happening was there was a guy watching for me. Right. And every time he saw seven, he had on the, on the walkie-talkie, seven's coming in. And so Richard would hide around the corner, and they'd move the clock. They'd turn the clock around. <laughs> I didn't know any of this at, until afterward, right? Right, right. So I'm by myself, and now I just need someone to damn well pace me. So I'm, I'm, I'm asking people, hey, can somebody, does anybody want to run with me? You know, this, so finally, um, Jim Alderson, James, sent one of his friends over because I lit into him. He's like, hey, Pat, how are you? When we were passing, he said, like, I'm not too damn good, James, all by myself. My body's leaking fluids. Like you said, I'm going to die. I don't, I don't know my times. So one of his friends runs with me. And he's like, all right, mate, I'll run with you. Hey, what pound the pace you want? I want I want a nine-minute, nine-second mile. Can you put that on your thing and can we right, do it? Because right. my phone didn't do that. I just, because I didn't have my full on with the, the phone and everything. And he goes, look at me, he goes, what's that in kilometers? <laughs> <laughs> we got to convert it. We don't it. have time for this. And I, I don't know, I'm in 14 miles. We got to convert this thing now. So we're screaming to people that are watching, can somebody convert kilometers to miles? And nobody knows what we're saying because we're running right by him. Yeah, sure. Finally, some cat figures it out. And he comes running up to us and he goes, I'm right. How are you? All right, listen. A nine minute, nine second mile pace is a five minute, 36 second kilometer. Good luck, mate. There you go. And he runs off. <laughs> and then the guy goes, all right. But he puts it in. We're on. Now we got the pace. Okay. Because I knew we were probably ahead of pace. Because remember. You had it right? in the bank. We've got time in the bank. <laughs> and I just want to do the flat hours. We make it. Right. Well, everything's great for a few laps. And then this guy's like, all right, Mike. Good luck. I'm like, where the hell are you going? He says, hey, I'm not here to run a marathon. I just want to do a few laps. I'm going to drink beer. <laughs> I'm alone again. Unpaced. Uh-huh. And you just put your, you, try, you know, you go, Johnny, wait, Johnny, wait. Finally, one of James's other friends came up and started pacing me. And he's such an experienced marathoner. He can run under three hour marathons, mm. this fella. And he wasn't with us the whole time. So he's fresh as a sure. daisy. Right. And he said, look, Pat, I, I think you're close. I don't know. I just got here, but I'm going to pace you. I know what a four hour pace is. I don't even have to look at a watch. I just, I can, I know the feel of it. Right. I said, all right, well, I'm with you. And so we, we, and I tried to stop and he would say, no, we're, you know, you can walk, but you are not stopping. We're going to keep, continue forward. He really pushed me. I thought it was coincidental that his name was Peter. Mm. Uh, I just love the biblical. Right, uh, sure. And, you know, so we, we finished. Anyway, towards the end, he says, look, 
I think you're close. When we hit that bathhouse, you're gonna be a half mile away. If you don't make it, you're not gonna miss it by a minute or two. I mean, if we're 30 minutes off, there's nothing you can do. Yeah, but if right. we're close, you're gonna get there. So I want you to sprint that last half mile. Give oh, it everything wow. you have. I know it's 183 miles, but give that last point four, all of it. I said, done. I had planted an American flag and a Texas flag 100 meters from the finish. Mm. And I had visions of what that was gonna look like. <laughs> I was gonna grab that American flag and that Texas flag and the chariots of fire thing would right, come up right, right. and my shirt would rip off and there would be an eight pack <laughs> and I would have this long flowing Fabian locks and I'd have a perfectly symmetrical face and I would run and there would be muscles that I don't have that would ripple and I'd go tit, 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 tit. <laughs> and I would cross the finish line, confetti would fall, the world would rejoice and it would be under four hours right. and it would be beautiful. That makes sense. Yeah. That's what it, but I think in reality what it looked like after running 183.4 miles, uh -huh. sleeping for 18 hours, uh -huh. traveling 30,000 miles on all seven continents, on a body frame that had never run anything more than 5K, right. with two poles in your hands, sprinting. I think I looked more like a <laughs> raccoon that had been soaked in gasoline, fed Red Bull, and set on fire. Because I think I looked like... <laughs> And I, so there are pictures to confirm. I was about to say, please tell there me there's are. a picture. Yeah, yeah so. okay. <laughs> We're going to have to get that for this uh, podcast. Yes. So I crossed the finish line, and I don't know if I made it. And I don't remember, I remember crossing the finish line, but I don't remember anything after, but I saw it on video. I collapsed. Oh, wow. And I just couldn't, gravity won, right? I'm sure, just done. Sure, you're done. And Richard, I don't know if I made it. And then I, I collapsed down and I look up and I go, did I make it? Did I make it? Did I make it? And I had to decide about one thing. Everyone in the crowd started to figure out what was going on because oh, wow. they're sitting there for three, four hours, yeah, right? Yeah, I mean, they're talking. So they're telling people, Hey, number seven, he's running this to the boys, trying to break four hours. So they're very encouraging the last few miles. And that's when it really permeated the whole crowd. Because sure. I'm hearing, if you ever heard an Australian try to do a Texas accent? I have, yes. Yeah, they're going like, <laughs> they were going like, Hey, cowboy! Eek me! Yeehaw! Go Texas! Like, what in the hell? What? Right I'm hearing these cat calls, right? <laughs> but it pushes you through. Uh, yeah, you can do it. So I, I sit up, and Richard Donovan comes running over to me. And every time I tell this, I get emotional. And he starts to cry. Mm. And then I, I see in my peripheral vision this big broken clock being turned around. And it says 353. Oh, wow. We've done it in three hours and 53 minutes. Wow. Broken it by seven minutes. Right. And the power of sevens, we'll get into here in a second. Sure. And Richard's just so excited. He says, you did it, mate. You did it. I, I, was, I was floored. I said, wow. Um, so I get up, and I had come in third place. That's amazing. I beat James Alderson. What about the Marines? The Marines were one and two. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I said to them, because I was close to them toward the end, and I said, if I beat you two, they're going to make this a Disney movie. <laughs> But the Marines, think about this in context. The Marines in the first marathon, they're, they're 20 years younger than me. I'm running this at 47. Right. They're 27. They're in perfectly prime physical condition, Correct. literally. They can run two-hour, uh, two 20-minute marathons. World-class stuff. Mm. They were considering breaking the continent record in Antarctica. They had the capability of doing it, but because we had six more, they didn't want to push it. Sure. They had beat me in, by the, in the first marathon by nearly three hours. Three hours. That's a lot of time. A lot of time. Oh, oh in, in, in Punta, they went and got pizza. They hung out. They were drinking beer. You know, I'm still running right. when this happened. They brought me pizza when I finished. <laughs> Three hours. In the last marathon, they only beat me by a few minutes. Oh, wow. How does a novice 47-year-old runner compete with a near professional world class? That's your body's breaking down. Things change. But because it's an inspiration. Sure. That's why. And anyhow, we, we finish... And we go back home, and what I, you know, my takeaways with this, Trey, are I went into this thinking this is this amazing life, you know, altering physical challenge. 
get my body back, regain my health. Sure. Wonderful. Yay. Right. Yeah. And also to raise as much money and awareness for pediatric cancer. Another, I think, noble cause. Absolutely. And those were my focuses. But the takeaway wasn't either of those things. The takeaway was, it's amazing what you can accomplish when you're moved by compassion, when you're doing something for someone else. Right. And also, love thy neighbor. I'll give you two quick examples. We got back, uh, not surprisingly, Dan Cardiga, one of the Marines, mm -hmm. won the aggregate time. So he won the World Marathon Challenge, got the medal and all. Okay. And he's doing an interview on Fox Happening Now, national television program. They gave him a 13-minute segment. At the end of the segment, she asks him, Danny, what are your takeaways from this? He says a couple of things, and then he said, well, and I was really inspired. A friend of mine, Pat Fallon, ran it with me, and he was running for a little boy named Johnny Wade. And he tells Johnny Wade's story to a nationally televised audience. Right. He has never met Kimberly Wade. She's never met him. He could have not known that Kimberly at that very moment happened to be watching Fox News. Oh, wow. At 1230, you know, in, uh, in the afternoon. Sure. And she sees this stranger talk about her son and fulfilling his wish that no other kid gets cancer, you know, moving towards that goal. He gave her one of the best and most wonderful gifts that she's ever received. And they've never even met. Wow. And then, you know, we got a lot of coverage from various newspapers and uh, TV outlets and things. So there was a newspaper in Florida that covered the story. And in my parents' neighborhood, they live in the villages in Florida. Right. A big retirement community. So one of the widows, the 86-year-old widow, wrote to them. She wrote a letter. She didn't write the letter to me. She wrote the letter to my parents. Hmm. Handwritten letter because she says she's not on the internet. <laughs> and she's thanking them for raising such a wonderful son. Oh, that's got to make you feel good. And she enclosed a check. Her or She had lost her husband to a cancer. And she enclosed a check for $25. The widow's might. Mm. She gave me one of the most uh, precious, priceless gifts that anyone's ever given me. Mm -hmm. And we've never met. Wow. Love thy neighbor. Yeah. Those are the takeaways. And then the postscript is, while we were running in Marrakesh and M Madrid, because they were so close together, my watch was, of course, on American time. And it considered that the same calendar day, <laughs> even though it was past midnight. Right. And we did 96,000 steps that day. If you have a Fitbit, 10,000 is a good day. 20,000 right. is amazing. That's right. 96,000 off the charts. That's right. And I jokingly asked, I said, I wonder if this thing goes to six digits or if it just rolls back to zeros. Good question. When the Kids Shouldn't Have Cancer Foundation got their 501c3 status, like February mm -hmm. of 2016, um, I wanted to do something to jumpstart that. We'd raised about $100,000 for another foundation in Tampa, um, but now I wanted to jumpstart theirs. Okay. So I said to my wife, I said, you know what we should do? I should try to run... Uh, and get to 100,000 steps in one calendar day, and we'll raise more money, and we'll give it all to the Kids Shouldn't Have Cancer Foundation. Right. And uh, she said, well, that's, yeah, that's a crazy idea, but a good one, but don't go anywhere. You're not going to do an anarchy. <laughs> no, baby, I'll do it here. We'll start at midnight, and that kind of thing. And so I said, I needed to pick a day. I don't know what day to pick. I go, well, pick the 100th day of the year, because it's symmetrical. 100,000 step challenge on the 100th day of the year. Yeah. Well, it was a leap year, 2016, and it just so happens that uh, April 9th was the 100th day. Normally, it's April 10th. Right. So I called Kimberly Wade and told her the story and the idea. And she goes, oh, I love that. And I go, Kimberly, I'm going to do it on the 100th day of the year. I'm going to do it on April 9th. And she starts to cry. April 9th is Johnny and Jackie Wade's birthday. Oh, wow. Again, coincidence or Godwink? Yeah. It was a Saturday. Yeah. So the Wades came down. And then we had a second mission. First mission, raise money for, for pediatric cancer research and specifically the Kids Shouldn't Have Cancer Foundation. Right. But number two, give Jackie Wade an instant, a moment, a flash where he's just a nine-year-old eating cake and ice cream on his birthday. Mm -hmm. And there's a wonderful picture because we did do it. And by the way, Fitbits go to six digits. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it. It took 54 miles, but it goes to 100,000 steps. I achieved it at 9 p.m. that night. Wow. The first marathon that day wasn't even hard for, you know, because it was Isn't in such good shape. Yeah. But it's the second one that was brutal. <laughs> but yeah, so I ran two marathons in the same day, which is essentially what we did on four and five anyway. Sure, sure. Uh, but anyway, we knocked it out. 
And there's a picture of Jackie blowing out his candles on a beautiful three-layered cake with a, on, you know, a 10,000 watt smile. Wow. And we achieve that goal as well because it's about love thy neighbor. Right, so. exactly. Well, thank you for letting me share this story. Uh, it's, an, it's an amazing story and, and thank you for allowing us to share this story with, with our audience because it's, it's inspiring. Um, I, I don't think you could have done any of that without Johnny's spirit being with you and, and the Holy Spirit being with you. So, yes, I agree. Um, if, if our listeners right now want to make a donation to yes. help uh, stop children from getting cancer, uh, where, where should they go? Uh, the kids shouldn't have cancer.com uh, online. Our entire community has rallied around this cause. And we have a lemonade stand, uh, but it's it's on steroids. There's like a hundred different stands. <laughs> we we're, we're raising fifty to hundred thousand dollars at this lemonade stand. That's incredible. Well, uh, Representative Pat Fallon, thank you for coming on the Trey Blocker Show. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you for sharing that story. It's absolutely incredible. Trey, thank you for giving me the opportunity. Absolutely. I love to share it, so absolutely. I hope you can tell. Well, thank you all for listening to the Trey Blocker Show. You can listen to us on YouTube or your favorite podcast app and at TreyBlockerShow.com. Thank you and God bless. This has been the Trey Blocker Show. Please subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app and visit TreyBlockerShow.com to donate so we can keep fighting to restore sanity to this great nation.